Welcome back with a smiling face. Links to previous episodes are given in the video description, so don't forget to like, subscribe and share the video. Echoes of Shattered Destiny Episode 17 Chapter 126-134 Wonderful! I sighed a bit more dramatically than I initially meant to, the only two people who can help us is a witch who could easily be DD by now and my mom, who actually is DD. Is resurrecting people a thing, or is that just in the movies? Just in the movies, dear. Cordelia replied, not at all disturbed. If anything, my comment gave her an idea. Her eyes lit up with the same mischievous light as Grandma's, only Cordelia's held traces of unearthly magic. Summoning her spirit, however. That could be doable. I'd need to leave town to get the supplies, but I could have everything ready within a few days. It already sounds like a bad idea, do you really think this is the way to remove your magical block? Maddox's gruff voice filled my head keeping my thoughts from drifting as I pulled onto the highway, seeing Brianna's car follow behind. I tried to keep my voice light, but I was nervous. Afraid of a little ghost. I used what weak humor I had to break up the tension in my chest. I honestly have no clue, but getting first-hand answers is something I can't pass up, if she even answers. Cordelia described it as a supernatural phone call. After all this, she better not put me on silent. Through the bond that connected Maddox and me, I could hear the muffled sound of a ringing cell phone. Maddox cursed, I've got to go, that'll be Zeke and Mason. We've assembled a small group to comb through parts of the surrounding mountains. There's every chance the witches or vampires could be hiding up there. Keep me updated if you find anything. I replied. Sure thing, beautiful. Rather than turn around and head straight towards Maddox like the mate Bond was telling me to do, I continued to the old house Cordelia and Rowena had been staying in. While Rowena got to know Holly and hopefully found a way through the shell of fear that kept her rooted in place, Brianna and I planned to spend our day helping them move their belongings. There wasn't time to furnish the new house and it was faster to move what furniture there was rather than wait. I was surprised to see a small moving truck as I pulled into the driveway, and even more surprised when I saw a head of golden hair peeking above a stack of boxes. Brianna pulled up alongside the road and hopped out, following me up the porch to where Cassidy stood. Oh, hey! Her baby blues lit up as she saw Brianna and I. She placed her hands in the back pockets of her frayed shorts and smiled. I hope you both don't mind. I got out of lacrosse practice early, so I figured I'd get a head start. I actually didn't know you'd be here, but we wouldn't mind the extra set of hands. I told her truthfully, looking at Brianna who nodded. A look of understanding crossed her face, which only aided in confusing me. Oh. Maddox didn't tell you? He must have gotten busy. Cassidy snorted, shaking her head. As she grabbed two of the smaller boxes, Brianna and I followed suit, she grinned over her shoulder as we descended the porch steps and placed the boxes into the small truck. He asked if I'd come help you two out, make things go by faster. If you ask me, I think he just wanted more time with you. The three of us got to work, hauling out the oak dining room table and pieces of the sectional. A few human men in a crappy pickup truck passed by the three of us. I could instantly tell they were human because the driver slammed on his brakes and sent them squealing to a stop, all to gawk at Cassidy who carried a mahogany dresser down the stairs by herself. A couple of hours and we ordered a few pizzas and took a short break. The soreness in my muscles wasn't entirely unpleasant and made me miss training even more. I made a mental note to start again as soon as I got the chance. You'll never guess who I ran into today. I said to Cassidy, shoving a second dresser out of the front door, 
next was the coffee table and entertainment stand, followed by the television that looked all too breakable. Who? Oh no, wait. Let me guess. Brandon. Ugh, thankfully no. I grimaced, I'll give you a hint. He's 5'11 but probably told you he's around 6'2. Cassidy's eyes turned thoughtful for a split second before she rolled them in typical mean girl's fashion. If it weren't for her sunny personality, she would have made the perfect Regina George. What does that tool want? She lifted an eyebrow. He actually gave me an explanation on why his girlfriend was calling him or should I say ex-girlfriend. Ex-girlfriend. She repeated, a manicured hand on her hip. Still sleazy. Brianna shouted over her shoulder, carrying a stack of boxes down the stairs and onto the truck's ramp. Cassidy nodded, agreed, still sleazy. Apparently his ex-girlfriend is mated to his younger brother. I elaborated, chuckling when Cassidy's lips popped open. She cringed just a tad, ouch, I'm not apologizing for breaking his nose, though. He could have easily chased after me to explain himself. What about his keyed motorcycle? I asked, smiling as Brianna's raucous laughter sounded from inside the moving truck. Cassidy shrugged, fair, I'll apologize for that. It is a really nice bike. With how often we'd get distracted talking and laughing with one another, we finished just as the sun dipped behind the tree line. Cassidy and Brianna agreed they'd take the moving truck to the new house and then drive back to get their cars, since Maddox sent me a mind link letting me know Giovanni had just gotten back into town. I found driving at night to be relaxing, even though with these twists and turns it was near impossible to see more than ten feet in front of you. Since there weren't any light posts, all I had to guide my way were the headlights of the car. The crisp breeze filtered in through the cracked window, carrying damp soil and pine trees. The shrill ringing of my cell phone filled the car, along with the harsh white glow from the screen lighting up. Tristan's name in a blurry photograph I snapped of him at night flashed on the screen. I let it go to voicemail, thinking he was calling to tell me Giovanni had gotten back. When it rang a second time, and I felt a sharp tug in my gut, I knew something had happened. I cursed and reached for my phone where it sat in the passenger seat. The harsh light left splotches in my vision, but I managed to hit the little green answer button before the screen faded to black. The only thing I will ever envy about you werewolves is your ability to mind link. Tristan's choppy but disappointed sigh filled the car, followed by the crackle of crappy service. I'm glad you're having a good day. I replied, if you called to tell me Giovanni's back, Maddox beat you to it. Actually, I'm calling because his voice cut in and out, broken up by harsh static. Nightmare. Nightmare. I repeated, Holly had a nightmare? About what? Holly had a nightmare, dark, hard to see I pinched the bridge of my nose feeling a dull throb in my temples as I tried to make out what he was saying. Glancing down at my phone, I stared at the four bars until I had no choice but to look back up at the road. I was approaching the welcome sign we had driven past on our way into town when Tristan's voice came through even louder and more urgent. In the car, sign, black boots, Lola my phone chimed, and I glanced down in time to see the picture Tristan had sent me. It was one I had taken and sent Brianna when we first ventured to the capital of this pack. The town sign we had all passed, the one that read Welcome to the Town of Pine Plains. Man in black boots, is going to make you ch. My head snapped up the moment his voice came through the phone, locked on a pair of eyes peering at me from beyond the windshield. That split-second glance was all I had before I slammed into an invisible wall in the middle of the road. The sight of pale skin and expressionless eyes were the last things I saw before the tang of blood and the sharp sting of pain took over every sense I had. 
It wasn't the glass digging into my face and eyes that hurt most. What hurt most was the bone-shattering pain of impact, the whiplash as my neck cracked and my head lurched in the opposite direction. I knew the car was rolling when my ribcage cracked and groaned, shoved against the seat belt repeatedly. I couldn't breathe until the car skidded to a stop, sending sparks skittering across the ground from the metal roof skating along the asphalt. The blood coated, inky tendrils of my hair clung to my face and obscured my vision. We need to get this glass out of our face. Our body is trying to heal with it in there. Maya snarled, but the sound ended with a whimper. I clenched my teeth and tried to reach the seat belt buckle. When that failed, I tried to wriggle free. As a last resort, Maya gave me what strength she could to make our nails elongate into claws. It was the distant crunching of glass that made me freeze. I turned my head to the shattered driver side window and spotted a pair of black boots just 20 feet away. Chapter 127 My hands trembled as I reached up and felt wildly for the seat belt buckle. My vision was tinted red from the blood that trickled down my face, but I couldn't he wouldn't he take my eyes off those boots. I must have made some sort of sound when the stranger took a step forward, because suddenly they started sprinting. The glass crunched beneath their feet, the sound grinding against my teeth as they got closer and closer. I knew how to keep a level head as my fear turned into full-blown panic but no amount of thrashing or struggling helped free me from the car. My fingers were slick with blood, making it impossible to find the button that would free me. Spots danced in my vision and every breath took much more of an effort than it should. I knew I had punctured something when the remaining air in my lungs crackled. Something gave beneath my fingers. The click of the seat belt was the last thing I heard before I slid from the seat and landed on the roof of the car. My hands and face stung from the pieces of glass embedded in them, which ratcheted higher with every movement I made. I turned my head and looked out the shattered window, feeling my breath come faster with each passing second. There were no scuffed boots sprinting my way, only chunks of metal and shards of glass. A wet cry tore itself from my chest as a face peered just outside of the car window. Why, I tried to ask, feeling my eyes roll as I passed out. My eyes snapped open, and I lurched forwards, feeling a sharp pain blossom across my chest and stomach. The instantaneous rush of adrenaline that surged through me, made my head throb until my vision turned blurry. I was battered by memories bulldozed by the pain of a harsh impact. I remembered the CH, the car that Maddox had loaned me, crushed like an empty soda can. He wouldn't care about the car no, but he would be worried about me. There was no mind linking him with my head pounding like this, so hard I could feel the vibrations in my teeth. A face flashed in my mind, the last thing I saw before I passed out. I slammed myself against the passenger door of the vehicle I sat in, barely registering the pain as I wiped at my eyes, trying desperately to clear my blurry vision. The spots faded from my eyes, and even though I knew my captor, I didn't relax. Maddox was going to be pissed. You look like St. Brandon said from where he sat in the driver's seat. His posture was relaxed and he didn't even bother looking my way as he dug through the console with one hand and tossed me a lukewarm blood bag. Drink up, we still got another two hours left. The first thing I did was glance down at his feet, which were in a pair of sneakers. No scuffed boots. I tore into the bag with my teeth and down the thick liquid, feeling my taste buds explode with flavor incomparable to human food. Like a cup of hot tea laced heavily with honey, the blood spread its warmth throughout my body, and eased some of the pressure still weighing on my chest. I met Brandon's eyes, uncaring that he watched me tear into the bag like an animal, because I just now registered what he had said. Excuse me? Two hours from where? That's kind of hot, he ignored my question and looked towards the highway. 
there was the shadow of mountains off in the distance, but those were the only ones in sight. The forest had thinned out too, becoming sparse as the buildings grew taller and the streets more crowded. A bridge sat up ahead, down below it was an even busier stretch of road. Does my brother ever let you drink his blood? Brandon don't play with me. I'll send this car right off the side of the bridge with us in it. I snarled, two hours from where? I didn't have that deadly calm voice Maddox had when he was seconds away from tearing someone's head off. Mine would swell with power, like the tendrils of shadow that writhed and gathered, reacting to the rage in my voice hoping I might be desperate enough to whisper their names. You're crazy enough to do that, aren't you? He snorted, then shrugged. Don't matter anyway, we're too far away for you to do anything but tag along, even my brother can't travel that fast. You and I are off to visit a friend of mine, Lola. Oh goddess, Maddox. He's probably destroyed half the pack by now looking for me. I groaned, feeling Maya begin to stir from my distress. Actually, when I stepped in all heroically and pulled you out of the car, I found your phone in the wreckage. Sent him a quick text letting him know exhausted you were after moving all of that furniture, and that you went out for drinks with that friend of yours, the perky brunette with the vampire mate. The blood was helping me heal faster, which was a miscalculation on Brandon's part. The more he talked the closer I found myself to running us off the road. He mind-linked the pack hours ago, finally found what was left of his car. Give me my phone. I snapped and held out my hand. Sure thing, sure thing. He nodded, too compliant for me not to know something was up. I wasn't at all surprised when he tossed it in my lap and added, battery died a few hours ago, and unfortunately I left my car charger at home. What a shame. I covered my face with my hands and groaned, he has no clue where I am, no clue if I'm wait, what happened to the glass in my face and hands. I picked out what I could. Brandon shrugged, then narrowed his eyes when I gave him an odd look. Don't go thinking I did you any favors. You're useless to me if you're not healed up and in tip-top shape. Also, pretty sure I'm at the top of Maddox's most wanted list since I'm ignoring his mind links. You know how paranoid he is, probably pieced it together already. I meant to ask, what did you hit that caused that much damage? An invisible wall. I groaned sinking into the seat because what else could I do? Courtesy of whatever witch or witches I've managed to annoy off. Well, then it's a good thing you're with me, because I just might be able to get you some answers. His grin was cocky and self-assured but had the same lopsided tilt as Maddox's. Bet you never saw that coming. How are you going to get me answers? I snorted. I thought all you were good for is getting drunk, pissing off Maddox, and chasing after schoolgirls. Those are my best qualities. I'm surprised you noticed them. Think about me often. He lifted an eyebrow but must have seen the hint of murderous rage still lingering on my face because he quickly dropped it. I might not be alpha of a whole pack, but I'm not without my connections. I happen to have a friend who, dabbles in magic. She conveniently stopped answering my calls the day you and my brother got into town. I want to know why. You kidnapped me and brought me outside of the pack boundaries because a witch you slept with ghosted you. I deadpanned. Brandon nodded then asked, how'd you know I slept with her? I didn't. I grunted, it was a lucky guess. We stopped at a crowded gas station on the outskirts of some city. I wasn't picking up the scent of any werewolves, but I could smell the DS on the humans lingering against the side of the building. It infuriated me how Brandon hopped out of the car, whistling as he filled up the gas tank. The AE knew I wasn't going to run. Even if I did, what good would it do me? 
When you sneak off to borrow someone's phone, make sure you tell Maddox how I saved your life and how I've behaved myself this entire trip. Brandon grinned, leaning against the side of the car as the numbers on the gas pump climbed higher. I turned my back on him and gave him the middle finger for good measure, hey. You owe me a life debt, now keep my brother from KG me. Maddox. Who is it? I sighed the moment I heard his harsh voice, earning an odd look from the cashier who hovered by the phone protectively, as though they had lost one before to a needy customer. He was in full alpha mode, ready to storm the borders of any pack if it meant finding me. Lola, where are you? Are you hurt? I thought since you texted you were all right. Tristan told me about Holly's nightmare. I found the car the damage doesn't matter. Are you with Brandon? Tell me where you are, I'll come get you. He said you were paranoid enough to figure it out. I was hurt, but your brother, helped bandage me up. Maya still hasn't woken up and my phone is DD, or I would have talked to you sooner. I chose my words carefully, glancing at the cashier whose nervous eyes flitted my way every couple seconds. I know this sounds crazy, but I think he saved my life. We're hours away from the pack boundaries and believe me, I know. He's a reckless who has wish, but he's taking me to meet a special friend of his one that might know more about what happened last night. I don't like this one bit. Going anywhere with Brandon it's not safe. He would never hurt you, but clearly, I don't know who he associates with. I don't know what intentions his friend has, but if you have to hunt them down for information, that's already a red flag. An echo of pain settled in my chest because I knew that the harshness in his voice was there to cover up the worry, the fear of losing me the first time. It resurfaced from time to time, turning his eyes dark and giving his touches a protective edge. Tell me where you are and we can speak with his friend together, I can't protect you there, Lola. From where I stood, I could see out the large windows, to the gas pump Brandon stood at. He caught my eye and waved, gesturing to the car with a dramatic flourish. Guilt lodged itself in my throat because I knew what I needed to do. I'll give you the address to the gas station we're at. We'll meet you here after we talk to his friend. She vanished on him the day you and I got into town if she does have something to do with this, and she knows we're coming, she won't stick around for long. I swallowed, I love you. Maddox. And I'll be here to tell you in person once I get the information we need. Chapter 128 I handed the phone back to the cashier, hearing Maddox's objections on the other end, wishing I could soothe that side of him that wanted to shield me from all danger. Tell him the address, then hang up. I told the cashier, deaf to her reply because it was Maddox's voice that rang in my ears. So, should I keep planning my escape, or did you delay for the time being? Brandon asked the moment I was within sniffing distance, unable to keep his mouth shut long enough to let me sort through the guilt that made me short of breath. I rolled my eyes at him, watching as put the gas nozzle back into its holder and gestured to the car, I'd open the door for you, but from what I've seen of you and my brother, you're not into the old school romance type of stuff. Are you? I stared at his knowing smile without so much as a fraction of embarrassment on my face. Those schoolgirls of yours a little vanilla, Brandon? Does it surprise you that much that there's women out there who want more than a few minutes of missionary, than a post s asterisk x rant about living in your brother's shadow? I didn't care I was being a bh. From how awful my night had gone, I figured I deserved a few minutes. Mind your own business or you won't have to worry about Maddox KGU, because I'll do it myself. After we track down your friend. I got in the car and slammed the door, savoring the coldness of the glass against my warm face. 
Brandon didn't open his mouth again but did turn on the radio so that AC slash DC trickled in quietly through the speakers. Dad would play this kind of music when Sean and I were kids, back when he could glide and run throughout the house. It was this fact and the headache I still had that helped me fall asleep. This time when I woke up, I knew exactly where I was. There was no avalanche of memories ready to flatten me, only the renewed annoyance that I was here with Brandon. The sun had vanished from the sky, so I knew I'd been asleep for a few hours. I jumped in my seat when the truck of the car slammed, and Brandon yanked open the driver's side door and got in. Here, shower and change into this. Hopefully, it fits. We don't have much time. He said, tossing a shopping bag and a blood bag onto my lap. I looked out at the seedy motel we were parked out front of smack dab in the center of some nameless city. There were lights everywhere. From the cars that crept down the roads, nearly bumping into one another with every turn, to the skyscrapers and neon lights that flashed in various colors. Where are we going? I asked. My witch friend works at a night club. One that'll kick you out in a heartbeat if you show up dressed like that with or without my jacket to cover the blood. He replied and tacked on, oh, and I'll want that dry cleaned. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. I'll get right on that. I snorted, balling up his jacket so it at least sting when I threw it in his face. I downed the blood bag while peeling my torn and clothes off my body. My favorite pair of leggings were littered with tiny holes from the glass that had shattered and sliced me to bits. If it hadn't been for Brandon's jacket, whose scent still clung to me like a cloud of noxious gas, the gas station clerk would have keeled over. Somewhere halfway through my shower, I felt Maya finally wake up, even with my enhanced vampire healing, Maya had to overexert herself just to patch up the largest of our wounds. After showering faster than I ever had in my life, I pulled out a thin scrap of fabric and a pair of dangerously sharp stiletto boots. Cute shoes, Maya yawned and stretched before shaking out her fur. I've been asleep for a while, haven't I? Doesn't seem like we've been kidnapped or captured, what happened after the ch? Oh, we've been kidnapped all right, we're just not trying to escape. I sighed and gave her a rundown of the last eight hours while I tried to figure out how to fit this scrap of fabric over my head. Of all people to find us, it had to be Brandon. She huffed needing no response to know that I agreed with her. I guess anything's better than the witch that made us ch. My bra was stiff and soaked through with blood. Naturally, that wouldn't have stopped me, but the dress Brandon had picked out was low cut with spaghetti straps. There was no putting my white turned red bra underneath that. The fabric was skin tight and the same dark shade as my hair. It would be a pain to move in if I needed to run but it was long enough to cover my backside. I'm keeping these shoes, I told Brandon, hope your heart wasn't set on returning them. Nah, you're good. He shrugged, glancing my way before pulling out of the parking lot. I stole them, anyway. Of course, you did. I replied, wondering why I had assumed any differently. Half an hour later, we were parked on some desolate city street right out front of a blacked-out brick building. Most of the buildings down the street were closed or shut down, apart from a 24-hr laundry mat. Instead of smelling sweat, and alcohol, all I could pick up was the light scent of laundry detergent. There was no red velvet robe manned by a beefy bouncer, or lines of men and women eager to get in. Actually, we were one of the only cars parked against the curb. Lola. I can feel you through the mind link again. Are you safe? A chill skated down my spine from Maddox's gravely voice. I'm on a plane heading your way. Tell my brother if there's so much as a hair out of place on your head, I'll KL him. Maya's awake and better than ever, and you got on a plane? 
And believe me, I gave Brandon a long look, he knows what's at stake. Stay safe, Lola. I'd lose my mind if anything happened to you. I know, but I will come back to you safe and sound. I did the first time, and I'll do it again. I felt better knowing Maddox had my back no matter the distance between us. He would scour the world for me or be in it all down hunting whoever brought me harm. I could feel such a large piece of myself missing hundreds of miles away. The hollow feeling only made me that much more determined to get this done. Where are we? I asked, there's absolutely no one here. This place is hard to find for a reason. It'd be too obvious if there were flashing lights and 300 people lining up down the block. Brandon replied with a casual shrug of the shoulder, and don't ask where we are because I'm not giving you an address. The first thing you'll do is tell Maddox. I raised an eyebrow, can you blame me? No, now let's go. I realized two things as Brandon opened one of the double doors and stepped inside, looking over shoulder to make sure I followed. The first thing was that this place was more than just hard to find. It was virtually impossible unless you already knew about it. I couldn't hear the thundering music or smell the scent of alcohol in the air, until the doors had closed behind us. The second thing I realized was that I should have asked more questions, because there was a distinct charge in the air that I had felt once before when Rowena did that ritual to reveal my binding mark. Magic hides this place. I whispered staring open-mouthed at the club around us, which was much larger on the inside than the building should have allowed. The ceiling alone was nearly fifty feet above our heads, with rows of lights that danced between purple, blue and pink. Circular platforms were placed in clusters around the club floor, where naked women covered in a healthy amount of body glitter danced freely. A balcony wrapped around the back of the club leading through a set of glass doors that took you outside. The bar itself sat at the center of the club, acting as the beating heart that kept the alcohol flowing. We were boxed in by a red velvet rope, in line behind a group of women that were flirting with one of the bouncers. Brandon linked his arm through mine before I had the chance to object and steered us towards the second bouncer, a guy with a shaved head and trimmed goatee. I heard about some mess on your brother's land. Wasn't sure when you'd be back. The bartender grinned, slapping Brandon hard enough on the back to make me win CE. My movement caught the bouncer's eye, well, now. Who's this little number? Never seen you bring a girl up in here. I instantly bristled and opened my mouth to let know exactly who I was when Brandon chuckled and pulled me closer to his side. She's spoken for. Was all he said, which wasn't nearly good enough. The bouncer's eyes widened, you went and found your mate. No. Lily and I are just, buddies, right? Brandon smirked, sharing one of those bro smiles with the bouncer. Some Neanderthal male bonding I could handle, but it was Brandon's next comment that made me momentarily see red. It's actually my brother she wants I wasn't sure what type of man Brandon's bouncer friend was, so after placing a solid punch to Brandon's gut, I slipped past the two of them and charged into the club. The bar was closest, so I veered in that direction. I stopped short of the bar and looked around, feeling ridiculous because I had no clue what Brandon's friend looked like. Now that I was much closer to the women dancing on the platforms, I noticed they weren't naked at all. Well, at least not entirely. Little heart-shaped pasties covered their NS, and what some would call a thong and others dental floss, circled their hips. Little gems placed on their neck, shoulders and legs sparkled under the color-changing lights. Little she-wolf, can I get you a drink? Chapter 129 I spun around, nearly bumping into the narrow chest of some man. He placed a hand against the front of the dress shirt he wore, drawing my attention to the rings speckled on his fingers. 
there were a few on his other hand, which clinked against the glass of alcohol in his hand. There was a big part of me and Maya that felt infuriated being called Little She-Wolf. We were proud of our title, both of them. We had bled and fought to claim them both, even if they weren't what we wanted at first. It went against my instincts to hide my position especially to another werewolf. She's good. I can get her whatever she needs, thanks. I wouldn't say I was relieved to hear Brandon's voice, but it did make me feel better that I wouldn't have to chase this guy off myself. Unfortunately, whenever you mixed alcohol, anger issues and copious amounts of testosterone, you were left with a person that couldn't take no for an answer. The stranger lifted one of his dark eyebrows but never once took his eyes off of Brandon as he asked, this guy bothering you. She just punched me in the gut hard enough to make me puke, which I would have done if I weren't the son of an alpha. Instead of becoming defensive, Brandon grinned. Now she can either punch you in your bird chest, or you can walk away and try your luck with some other unfortunate soul. I don't need you to defend me. I told Brandon once the drunk stranger stumbled away, muttering under his breath about and their boyfriends. Brandon groaned like a child, you're as boring as Maddox. I'm boring? I'm sorry I don't live to entertain your immature a asterisk s. I snapped, lowering my voice to a hiss when a few nearby women glanced my way. By chance, what do you find fun, Brandon? Is it kidnapping people in the middle of the night to take them out of pack boundaries knowing said person has vampires and witches after them? You want to know what I find fun? He snickered, meeting my eyes for a second before focusing on something further back in the club. When a flash of recognition sparked in his eyes, I spun around. I could see the back wall of the club in between the sea of dancing bodies, and the roped-off area labeled as VIP. Right next to that section was an unassuming door that read Restricted Employees Only. There was another cluster of circular stages back that way, larger than the others in the club. Where the others had three women dancing, this one had six. One of those six was a girl not much older than me, with thick thighs, tanned skin and wildly curly hair. The golden body glitter across her shoulders and B.S. didn't twinkle as much as the others because she had stopped dancing to stare Brandon's way. Maya's ears perked with interest when the dancer's wide brown eyes darted down to us. Even with the flashing lights that changed color every few seconds, I could see this girl visibly pale. She stepped off the stage and beelined towards two human bouncers talking just five feet away. Is that your friend? I asked without looking away from the girl. She's looking at me like she knows me. Yeah, that's her, Brandon frowned, just as confused as I. When the two bouncers leaning against the wall looked at us and started walking our way, giving Brandon's friend the chance she needed to slip through the employee's only door, I knew I needed to act fast. Lola, what are you she knows something was all I said before I kicked off into a run. People were already veering out of the way, spotting the two meathead bouncers before seeing my whopping 5-foot 3-inch self. The only thing I had learned from those fake friends I ditched Brian offer was how to walk, run, and sprint in a pair of stilettos. Out of all the things I'd been trained in, this was one I didn't think I'd be using. I could hear Brandon keeping up behind me but it wasn't him who'd hit the bouncers first. Just by looking at them, I could almost anticipate their moves. The one with the larger arms would try to grab me, thinking I'd be easy to subdue because of my small frame. The other, whose arms were longer and muscle more dispersed, would snatch me up if I managed to get away from the first one. I remembered my favorite of Chris's training lessons and let the fond memory float to the surface of my mind. He had taught me to keep an eye on my surroundings, that too many warriors make the mistake of relying on their muscle and skill, when there's so many other ways to win a battle. 
A group of already drunken men booed and groaned when I snatched a full pitcher of beer off their table, all without breaking my stride. The strong-smelling alcohol didn't have time to drench my hand, because I was already hurling it at the beefy one's face. A painful crack was heard, followed by an explosion of ice and beer. I avoided his flailing grasp and kicked the other as hard as I could, ducking when he swung that long arm out at me. In the chaos of it all, I swore I could hear Brandon laughing. As I'd hoped, his fist missed me and collided into his co-worker's face. It bought me just enough time to sprint past the two of them, through the employee door Brandon's friend had vanished behind. There was no time to stop, so I had no choice but to take in my surroundings as quickly as possible. With Brandon right behind me, we darted into the employee's only section, which happened to be a narrow hallway that ended with a sharp left turn. There were girls giggling back here, and men talking over upbeat music. The sound trickled down the hallway, coming from all directions. I followed my gut and darted down the hall, knowing that checking every single room would only slow us down and waste precious seconds. Almost all of them had signs that read available or occupied. The ones whose sign was flipped to occupied had several sounds and scents emerging from beneath the doors, all of which I ignored. We took that left-hand turn just as the door we had come through burst open. I could hear their heavy footfalls and knew there were too many for Brandon and I to take on in a fight. There were only single doors lining the hallways, but up ahead there was a set of two. Both were open, pinned against the wall so that music and laughter spilled out. We made another sharp turn and darted into the room. A circular table larger than the bar in the club sat in the middle of the room, surrounded by expensive white leather booths. There had to be at least twenty different men, and nearly the same number of dancers. Glasses of wine and beer littered the table, along with money and bottles of expensive champagne. I didn't pay attention to what the dancers were doing, or how some of them weren't really dancing at all. All I cared about was the set of doors farthest to us, and the sign that read Dancer Dressing Rooms. The thundering sound of feet were growing closer, so much that I could hear a few of their gruff voices. Without hesitation, I beelined straight for the doors. The circular table wasn't very tall, which made it all too easy to leap onto it to continue running. The drunk men not groping and tasting the dancers complained, cursing as they pulled their wads of money and bottles of alcohol away. For good measure, I sent a few of those expensive champagne bottles flying their way with a little kick from the toe of my stiletto. You're crazy, Brandon huffed, laughing as he hopped off the table behind me and followed as I raced towards the dancers' dressing rooms. This hallway was identical to the one we had just come from, only the doors that lined the walls had plagues with names printed on them. What's her name? I hissed quietly, slowing to scan each name all while keeping my ears peeled for the approaching bouncers. Clara. Either Brandon's witch friend was confident in her abilities, or she actually thought we wouldn't go chasing after her, because the door to her dressing room was cracked open. I could hear her in there, rummaging through something as she spoke quietly under her breath. I crept up to the door, staying flat against it as I turned my head and peeked inside. Not only was her back to the door, but she was crouched and digging through a leather trunk. Something sparkly in her hand caught my eye, a slinky dress she shoved into the suitcase at her feet, shoved onto the small pile of clothes she hastily packed. If she was anything like the witch that broke into my house, Maddox's car, I knew that I'd only have one chance at this. Barreling through the doors with my hackles raised would give her too much time to react. Instead I slipped inside, taking care not to open the door any more than it already was. I wasn't much closer, but it was enough. She heard the creak as Brandon tried slipping through the door, I could tell in the way her shoulders tensed. The moment she went to stand, I lunged at her. 
the girl must have had no form of self-defensive training because her only plan of action was the little baggie of purple powder in her hand. It coated her fingertips from where she had tried to pinch some. I wasn't sure what it was, a weapon or some kind of defense, but I disarmed her the way I would any other opponent and sent the cloth baggy tumbling to the floor. You, I took a deep breath, hating myself for skipping so many training sessions. She flinched, uncomfortable with the sharpened points of my claws against her carotid artery, are just who we were looking for, Clara. Chapter 130 she opened her mouth to speak but stopped when I brought my finger up to my lips. The thunder of combat boots sounded outside the door, never once stopping as they continued down the hall. I gave Brandon a confused look, but it was Clara who spoke. They aren't allowed to come into the dancers' rooms, she swallowed. I could feel her slender throat move beneath my hand. The glitter on her cheeks sparkled every time she looked between Brandon and me. Lola, I'm at the gas station. Fill me in, what's going on? Maddox's voice broke through my thoughts, like two streams merging into one. Found his friend, going to get some answers. I don't have time to explain everything, but once we're safe, I'll give you a rundown. I promised him holding back a sigh as his grounding presence washed over me, reminding me to stay fearless and in control. I'd been looking at Brandon when I felt a prickling sense of awareness crawl up my spine, like someone had grazed the back of my head with their fingers. I narrowed my eyes at the witch, positive she had used some kind of magic on me when the feeling vanished. All right, we found your friend. Now what? I asked waiting for something anything to happen. Once I was sure I felt no different, I pushed the issue from my mind to deal with later. Your guess is as good as mine, I didn't think we'd make it this far. I'm definitely getting blacklisted after this. My head snapped towards him, and I stared at him in disbelief. I'm not sure why I was so surprised, everything he did was on a poorly calculated whim. He proved that much by kidnapping me instead of taking me to a hospital. You stormed all the way here with no plan and your biggest worry is getting blacklisted from the club. I scoffed. It's a really good club, and I did have a plan. Find Clara and ask why she ghosted me when you and Maddox came back into town. He replied, fully convincing me there was no way he was the son of an alpha. I wondered if there was a time when Brandon took anything seriously. The way he had laughed as we ran, it sounded like he was having the time of his life. I knew that I was going to be the one to get us out of here, and that fact only made me resent him more. I won't let Maddox KL you. That honor is going to me. I promised him, frowning at the girl whose throat I had pinned to the wall. Look. I'm sure you're nice and all, but you're coming with us. We're bound to get caught if we stay here. I'm positive there's an exit back here, so lead the way, Clara. I wrapped my hand hard enough around her wrist to bruise, keeping my nails elongated to remind her that one swipe was all it took. Not a single part of me enjoyed this, digging my nails into this girl's skin as she led us down the hall but I could feel how jittery she was and knew that she'd take off if my grip slipped in the slightest. Something had her thoroughly freaked out, and it wasn't me. I liked to think Brandon was taking my promise seriously. His eyes scanned each door, drifting down the hall to search for any movement. The slightest sound and he would turn his head. I hesitated when my stomach unexpectedly dropped the silence that stretched down hall after hall was suddenly unsettling. The sound of music and cheering, it was so distant that it no longer felt real. The feeling persisted, even when I spotted the flickering exit sign hung from the ceiling at the end of the hall. Just below it was a metal door propped open with a cinder block. The scent of stale cigarettes and day's old garbage hit me the moment we stepped outside. 
we stood in a narrow alleyway lined with garbage bags stacked on top of one another. Half were bursting at the seams, with little claw marks dragged down the sides. I looked around, listening for the rats that had torn open so many of these bags. I heard nothing, not rats, or the sigh of a gentle breeze. Something's wrong. I said the words out loud the same moment Maya said them in my head. I can feel it too, Clara whispered. Brandon was smart to look worried, can your witchy senses be a little more specific? We crept out of the alleyway, emerging onto the same street Brandon had parked on or I thought it was. I looked down the street and spotted the 24HR laundry mat. The neon sign had been turned off, along with every light inside. The door that had been propped open was now shut. Ah, come on. Brandon's voice echoed, making Clara and I jump. Keep quiet. I hissed, we just said something doesn't feel right I noticed it then, the reason for Brandon's outburst. This was the street we had parked on, only his car wasn't where we left it. I wasn't above stealing a car, not when this sinking feeling in my stomach told me to hurry up and get moving, but there wasn't a single car in sight. Brandon threw his hands in the air, but his voice was significantly quieter this time. I just upgraded the exhaust. SW your exhaust I was cut off by Clara's low whimper. Both Brandon and I noticed her stiff posture, the way her jaw was clenched and eyes wide as she stared down the street. There were two hooded figures almost a hundred feet away, standing beneath the golden glow of a street light. All could see were the dark clothing they wore, and the pale skin of their hands as they hung at the figure's sides. Brandon inched backwards until he stood at my side, well, that's not creepy or anything. You think those are took my car? Suddenly Clara gasped and tried to pull away, only she wasn't trying to run but instead positioned herself behind Brandon and me. You know what, just keep me from getting KD and I'll tell you what I know. She stammered. What worried me was her sudden shift from wanting to run to begging for protection, as if she knew that running from those two would end badly. Are they after you? I frowned trying to find the reason for her fear if she weren't the one being hunted. Her eyes never left the two strangers, no, they're after you. The street light closest to us turned off, followed by the next one and the next one. They're witches, Brandon trailed off, his voice uneasy. Clara glared at Brandon, but the fierce expression was ruined by her fear, did you really think you could bring her here without someone noticing? Little by little the street was plunged into absolute darkness, increasing the feeling in my gut until I was 100% sure of its source. The only street lamp still lit was the one the strangers stood beneath, and within half a second, that one went out too. I took a step back, unable to peer through the darkness that had swallowed the witch's hole. Twenty feet closer than they'd been standing, a small ball of flame appeared out of thin air crackling from the sudden rush of oxygen. It was the size of a softball and appeared to be growing bigger. Whoa, what kind of magic is that? Brandon asked the same moment I realized the ball of flame wasn't growing bigger, it was just getting closer. Clara's jaw went slack as she shouted, Elementals. I grabbed hold of Brandon's shirt and took off down the street to our right, Letting go only when I could hear the heavy thud of his feet behind me, Clara had slipped out of my grasp, but I knew she wouldn't try to escape. I understood exactly why she wouldn't have survived on her own when the compacted ball of fire hit where we'd been standing, sending a plume of flame nearly six feet into the air. It was like the street had been doused in gasoline. After a few turns and a shortcut down an alley, we were able to stop. I spotted a few cars here and there. Most were rusted pieces of scrap metal limping on their last legs. We'd be better off shifting and carrying Clara on our backs. Not happening. I'm no horse. Maya bristled, 
her grumbled complaints fading into the background of my mind. Why haven't the human police been called? I asked, someone had to see that fire out there. In this part of the city, you hear something like that you stay away from your windows and turn your television up. You don't call the cops. Clara shook her head, searching with her eyes as she caught her breath. We can't run from them, they'll find us before long, oh, I knew I should have called out today, you're a witch too. Why don't you do something? Brandon asked Clara, who frowned. My magic doesn't work that way. She shook her head. I caught the reluctance in her eyes and knew she was holding back when she tacked on, I have to be up close to do anything, and they'll KL me before I get the chance. Why can't we run from them? What is an elemental? I asked a bit harsher than I meant to, but I could hear the manic quiver in her voice and knew that it would only get worse the more flustered she became. It's a rare type of magic, so rare that any witches able to use it are taken as kids, sent away to train. There was more to the story, I could tell from the tone of her voice but now wasn't the time to ask. And they wouldn't send elementals after you if they didn't have another witch tracking your location. They were just trying to tire us out, wear us down until we slipped up and eventually got caught. She was right. Running only bought us a handful of seconds. If we can't run, what can we do? I, can't use my magic right now. I could feel panic bubble and threaten to rise, but I had kept my cool too many times to give up now. We have no weapons, nothing at our disposal. Only our wolves and, the word slipped past my lips as I caught sight of the writhing tendrils of darkness slithering down the alleyway the shadows, I'd realized too late that they weren't running towards me, but away from the sudden ball of flame that shot down the alley, illuminating every crappy backyard and rat-infested dumpster it passed. At the other end of the alley, the second stranger stood. There was no flaming projectile thrown away, only the sickening snap and crack of the asphalt splitting open, making the ground tremble as it neared closer. Through the backyard. Brandon shouted, and without warning he grabbed Clara by the waist and tossed her over the chain-link fence to our right. I felt the dull sting of metal digging into my hands as I flung myself over and grabbed Clara's arm before she could fall. We avoided the scattered toys that littered the backyard, jumping the front fence just as another flaming projectile was thrown our way. This one hit the fence we had just hopped over. We stood so close that I could feel the heat lick at my cheeks and forehead. Wasting no time, we took off again, turning corners and darting down alleyways to throw them off. I felt Clara's hand brush my shoulder as we ran and turned my head to glance at her. Shadows, you can control the shadows. She panted, her voice held just a flicker of hope. Use them, use them before they catch us. Chapter 131 What? I can't do that. You have no idea what you're asking me to do. My surprise slowed my pace, and my legs groaned miserably as I pushed them harder, forcing us to keep up. They'll want something in return, right? She huffed, continuing without waiting for an answer. Her voice cracked, desperation bleeding through. Don't use them to KL them, just to get us away a distraction or something that'll help us get a head start. I assume you've got somewhere safe to go. I nodded, there's no way they'll mess with us once we're back in pack territory. Good, because you're taking me with you. I was safe and sound until you two busted into my dressing room for the most part, anyway. What matters is I was out and you two dragged me right back in. I had no clue what she meant, and neither did Brandon from the confusion that creased his eyebrows and made his pace slow. You have to use them to get us out of here, or we're not going to live past tonight. Frustration crackled and spread throughout my chest like a sparkler, and even though I was sure it was my imagination, 
I swore I could feel the shadows waiting eager to hear me ask for their help after months of ignoring their presence. I skidded to a stop, spotting a couple dumpsters surrounded by a wooden privacy fence. It was meant to keep the rats and raccoons away but judging from the scraps of trash piling up in the drainage ditches, it wasn't working. Brandon grimaced from the smell but followed Clara and I into the small area without complaint. I no longer had to try, the darkness was a part of me as much as my vampire side. The ability to control the shadows would never be a good one it would never be one of pure intention or without temptation. There was always that knowledge that anything anything I wanted was within arm's reach. All I had to do was pay the price. I felt their cold wash over me first but gave them no reaction. Clara shuddered, and the shadows hidden within every corner of the alley and trash area we stood in writhed. A thousand voices, a thousand razor blades slashing across the gritty surface of a chalkboard, all coalescing together into one ear-piercing voice. Now you call on us, to free you from danger, to vanquish the puppets that hunt you down, I paused. Puppets, why would you call them that? Brandon gave me an odd look, and Clara began to before she looked down. Anyone could see the shadows. It was something I realized a long time ago, back when Mason's mate had lost her life to a deal I'd made. Only the vampire monarch could use them haggle with them, but anyone could see them. Tristan had claimed that working with my father, always being in such close proximity to them, over time he found himself able to see them. The same had happened for Brianna and Maddox, even though I hadn't called on them since. The puppet master pulls the strings, meddles with fate, hides from us, I shuddered, I couldn't help it. Whoever whatever was behind this, they were hiding from the shadows. Immortal, ancient, all-knowing and the mastermind behind all of this was somehow avoiding their gaze. What's your price for concealing us from the elemental witches long enough to get a car, and get out of here? I asked, knowing any more information given on their part would come at a price. They would give those little slivers of information to tempt, to entice me into making another deal. It was what they thrived on the sacrifices made in the name of shadow and darkness. Our price is blood, blood from the Alpha's second-born son, enough to temporarily sate our thirst, I looked up at Brandon, they want your blood. No way, not happening, they're not getting my blood. He shook his head, his voice left no room for argument. Three minutes later, the pavement surrounding the dumpsters glittered from a coating of fresh blood. Since there was no direct lighting on it, the thick metallic substance almost looked black. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm getting a little woozy here. Brandon grumbled, holding his arms out so that the blood trickled down his hands and onto the ground. He dipped his head and instantly jerked back. It was more than refreshing seeing something other than cockiness on his face, even if it was fear. Those things they're taking my blood. I glanced down at the tendrils of shadow, each taking their turn as they slithered through the puddle of blood on the pavement, taking more and more with each pass. All right, that's enough for you all. Now it's time to hold up your end of the deal. I told them, knowing Brandon had given more than enough. He stood there, only partially green in the face as I left wound after wound on his wrists. Thanks to our advanced healing, I had to reopen the slashes every few seconds. They devoured the rest of his blood, leaving the pavement cleaner than it had been before. They were bloated as they circled our feet, fulfilling their end of the bargain with whatever ancient magic they possessed. It's like ice water, but worse. Clara's teeth chattered, wrapping her arms around the robe she wore. This time the cold pierced deep past flesh and muscle until my head ached with a pain similar to brain freeze. Suddenly, the colors around us faded, becoming muted and washed out. The green of the dumpster now looked like muddy water, but the shadows behind it I could see every one of them. 
Not only that, but they clung to the three of us like an aura void of all color. We emerged from our hiding place, onto the alley we had been running down. As we reached the end of the alley, Brandon flung his arm up at the last minute. I realized why as I ran into it, stumbling backwards and out of the way of the elemental witches as they turned the corner. There was no seeing their faces beneath those hoods. All I could make out was the curve of their chins, and how their physiques appeared thin beneath the layers of blacked-out clothing. Clara gasped and slapped a hand to her lips, pulled out of the way by Brandon. I thought she said they came this way. One of the witches spoke in a soft soprano, which felt completely out of place given both had tried to KL us. The second's voice was raspier, but still noticeably feminine. Clearly they're hiding. The second replied sourly, she said this would be easy. The witch with the attitude held her hand out, making a tiny flame sprout from her palm. It flickered and crackled in the night, casting a little golden halo that drifted farther and farther as they walked down the alley. I took a step forward and the feeling hit me like a freight train. There was no stopping myself, even if I wanted to. I looked back at Brandon and Clara, find us a car and meet me back here. Clara looked more than worried, but instead of trying to convince her kidnapper turned savior, she looked up at Brandon. If you're taken or KD, you know you're signing my DH certificate, right? He said dryly, not an inkling of humor on his face. Then you better find a car and get here before I come back. I replied. He glanced at the witches down the alley and nodded, Don't be an idiot, Lola. Don't plan on it. As I watched them turn and walk down the street, I realized that might have been the first semi-decent thing Brandon said to me so far. It didn't take me long to catch up with the witches, but during that short amount of time their entire demeanor had changed. The one with the soft soprano had a cell phone placed against her ear and was pacing along the sidewalk as she spoke in a hushed voice. The second witch stood a few feet away, trembling and snarling like a newly turned werewolf. There was a scent clinging to them, but it was odd to say the least. The one on the phone smelled like fresh soil, and the one ready to combust reminded me of a campfire. She's lost connection to her. It's like they vanished into thin air. The first witch said softly. She sighed when her companion let out an angry screech, hurling a ball of flame towards a decrepit shed that looked to be standing on its last legs. The entire structure was engulfed in flame, which inched closer to the drooping tree branches hanging feet above. I mean, come on. We're constantly told how special our magic is but we're the ones locked away. We never get to see any action. She hissed. Instead she sends out these witches that posses a shadow of our power. We could infiltrate that stupid pack ourselves. The aura of darkness that surrounded me pulsed, sending a rush of cold down my spine that let me know I had no more time left to spare. I began to back down the street. Closer to the alley I emerged from when the soft-spoken witch replied to her companion. It was her reply that made me stop in my tracks, invoking fear that felt a thousand times colder than the shadows that hid my presence. You know why she sent them instead of us. They blend in better, and they'll have everything set up when she's ready to slip past the borders. By the time the Tribrid realizes she's there, it'll be too late to fight Bark. Chapter 132 Make sure he's not D.D. back there. I grunted, glancing in the rearview mirror to see Brandon slumped over. Clara unbuckled her seatbelt and turned around. I could smell her sugary sweet perfume as her curly hair brushed against my shoulder. A few muffled jabs sounded from the back seat, and it took me a few seconds to realize she was poking and prodding at him. Get up. Brandon. You lost some blood, quit being a baby. Not all of us have supernatural healing. She scolded him, 
you're lucky I don't just throw you out of this car hunting me down and making a mess of my life. Brandon groaned and mumbled something unintelligible, which was proof enough that he hadn't died in the back seat of this rusted Mustang. I'm sure he'd throw a fit knowing he expired on cracked leather that smelled strongly of tobacco and cat P.S. I've called dibs on KG him. I told her, swallowing a manic giggle when she sighed deeply. And I am sorry we made a mess of your life, but you have information on something that affects thousands of people. I hope you understand that I can't just let that go. Even though I knew little to nothing about her, I didn't mind Clara. She was a bit skittish, but anyone who talked to Brandon like that had to have a good personality even if she did make the mistake of sleeping with him. I wasn't nearly as stone-cold as Maddox, but I had learned enough from him to know that the leader of a pack needed to put their people first, and getting this information was what mattered most to me. If protection was what she wanted, we'd provide it but only on the condition she tell us everything she knew. I understand, that's what makes this worse. She sighed, buckling her seatbelt while providing no further explanation. I had to remind myself to put the car in park when we pulled up to the gas station, because instantly I spotted the dark-tinted windows of Maddox's SUV. He was already out of the vehicle, taking long strides as he headed straight towards me. I had just enough time to lift my arms, wrapping them around his neck as his slid around my waist. My fingers were tangled in the shorter strands of his hair my forehead tickled by the longer pieces on top. Only the tips of my toes grazed the ground, but it all paled in comparison to the explosion in my chest when his lips met with my own. I trailed my hands to his face, feeling the sharp edge of his jaw beneath my fingers. Our kiss wasn't the desperate, tearful kind you saw in the movies. We weren't clawing at one another as if we couldn't get enough. His lips moved softly, savoring every taste and touch, until we were both forced to pull away for air. When he rested his forehead against my own and stared at me with eyes of liquid gold, relief finally blossomed in my chest. We were attacked you're safe, was all he said. Not a question or statement, but reassurance because he could see and feel how shaken up, I was. Whether it was the sudden lack of adrenaline or the information I had yet to process, he could tell my nerves were fried. Touching him, feeling the warmth of his arms around my waist and his breath across my cheek, it chased away the sense of dread I felt the moment I heard what the elemental witch said. I nodded, I'm safe. Maddox's eyes flared with interest when he noticed the tight dress I wore, why are you wearing that? Brandon chose that moment to startle awake, banging his head on the roof of the Mustang as he sat up. The SUV Maddox had gotten out of pulled forwards, next to the car we had commandeered. I was surprised to see Mason and Zeke inside, both of which got out and greeted me with relieved smiles. Brandon pulled himself out of the Mustang, a hand against his head. He steadied himself against the side of the car groaning when Maddox looked his way. We gonna do this right here? Cause I'll still make you work for it. He grunted, clearly in no condition to fight. I call dibs on KG him, I told Maddox, patting his chest. Besides, we have a lot to talk about. I looked at Clara as I said this, who had just gotten out of the passenger side. The sheer robe she wore ended around mid-th and was cinched tightly at her waist. She shuddered with every chilly gust of wind, brushing back the curls that covered her face. I noticed how she glanced hesitantly towards Mason and Zeke before inching closer to them. It was her paranoid glances down the street that kept me from thinking she were up to anything sinister. Mason shrugged out of the jacket he wore and held it out to Clara an unreadable look on his face as she murmured a thank you and slipped it on. Some of the concern I'd been feeling for him eased when Zeke grinned at him over Clara's shoulder, making him roll his eyes. Even though I wasn't cold, Maddox pulled his leather jacket off and draped it over my shoulders. 
I was drowning in the fabric, but I'd never complain about being surrounded by his scent and lingering warmth. We ditched the Mustang and headed to the airport Maddox had landed at. Taking the pack's private jet wasn't best of options, since just about every werewolf had a love-slash-hate relationship with airplanes, but it was our fastest mode of transportation. The airport was packed with people, rushing about with suitcases rattling behind them, as though it weren't nearing one in the morning. With just a few short words to a service desk clerk, the six of us were led through a set of doors and down a long stretch of hallway. I kept my arm tucked around Maddox's waist, molding myself against the side of him while also keeping Clara in sight. We were led to a small waiting area, free from all the people that had been traversing around the airport. Zeke was the only one who remained standing, looking more and more nervous as the seconds ticked away. Are you sure we should get on a flying metal box with a witch? He cleared his throat, his eyes flickering towards Clara. No offense, plane crashes are a fear of mine. Maddox contemplated what he said and nodded, he's got a point. It was true, there was plenty room for concern since we had no clue what Clara could do. There was no point in asking Brandon, not when he was especially clueless about most things. It wouldn't surprise me to hear he knew nothing about the girl he'd been sleeping with other than her being a witch. I had no gut feeling telling me she'd magically CH the plane or send it free-falling mid-flight, but that brought little comfort. What I hadn't expected was for Clara to defend herself. Her face held bravery, but there was no missing the flicker of intimidation when she met Maddox's stare with one of her own. The witches that attacked us saw me with your girlfriend, the only reason I'm here and not running far from all of you is because I have no way to protect myself when they come searching for me. I wasn't raised a snitch, but those witches won't just KL me and be done with it. She huffed, trying to calm her shaky voice. The way her hands trembled, and leg bounced, all of it told me she was telling the truth. This thing that was going on, she had wanted no part of it. It wasn't just Brandon and I she'd been avoiding. All it took was one look shared between Maddox and I to know we were on the same page. Mate. Lola is my mate, not my girlfriend. Maddox said, both correcting and distracting her. What's the difference? She asked curiously, no longer bouncing her leg. I tilted my head at her, you've been hooking up with a werewolf and don't know what mates are. When I turned my head to give Brandon a questioning look, he shrugged and said, she's adopted, as though that explained everything. There's a huge difference. Maddox replied, one is based off a crush, the other a bond that brings together who haves of the same soul. A bond like that leaves a mark. I was raised by humans, and as long as Brandon was single, I had no reason to care about werewolf stuff not until recently, anyway. She explained. Her eyes homed in on the mark that stood out against Maddox's pale skin before they searched for mine. I knew what observation she had made before she said it, you have two marks, is that normal? No it's not normal at all. I sighed, thankful I was spared from explaining further when the attendant popped her head in to let us know the plane was ready. Chapter 133 I'd never been on a plane before, much less a private jet that could easily double as an apartment if you ever found yourself without somewhere to live. I shuddered at the thought of being on a flight long enough to make use of the walk-in shower and king-sized bed in the back of the plane. The only positive things about this flight were the tiny bottles of liquor that chased away my gnawing worry, cuddling up to Maddox for the next hour, and the fact that there were no shadows 40,000 feet in the air. Everything else down to the turbulence and the pitch black sky, I absolutely hated. Maddox might be alright with waiting until this plane lands to ask what happened, but I'm not. Give us the details starting why you're dressed like a movie star and this one, isn't dressed. Zeke leaned in, 
his hands clasped tightly together. I didn't miss the way his eyebrows were creased, or the way the vein in his neck stuck out. Maddox rolled his eyes, you didn't give me the chance to ask. Sorry, but you were taking too long. He replied, glancing around the plane with that same look of unease on his face. I found it curious that an Alpha would fear plane crashes, but I wasn't going to tease him for it. We all feared something. I need a distraction before I spend the rest of this hour tweaking. I'm not dressed because I'm a performer at a club well, I was a performer, Clara explained, giving me and Brandon long looks that let everyone know we were responsible for her sudden resignation. She turned her attention to Maddox, until your mate decided to beat up two bouncers and storm the employee's only area to hunt me down. You should have seen the looks on their faces when she threw that pitcher of beer Brandon began, ready to shovel a handful of chips into his mouth when he paused. Maddox was glaring daggers at his brother, his eyes pitch black, an arm draped protectively over my shoulders. Anyway, we would have been back sooner rather than later if it weren't for the creepy sister witches. Creepy sister witches. Zeke repeated just a flicker of fear in the Alpha's eyes. Yup. One threw fireballs and the other made the ground crack open. Brandon nodded, mimicking throwing a fireball only it was a sour cream and onion potato chip. So what you're saying is not only did you put Lola's life at risk once by kidnapping her from the scene of an accident rather than taking her to the hospital, but you also put it at risk numerous times afterwards, and for what? Maddox's voice was as flat as the lack of color in his eyes, so dark that his pupils had vanished. He swiveled his eyes to Clara, who paled. What was your reason for taking Lola this far away from pack boundaries, knowing there are people after her? Whoa, whoa. Technically, I saved her life twice three times actually. Brandon retorted. First. I pulled her from that wreck and made sure she had a blood bag. Then I let her nearly bleed me dry for a pack of demonic leeches, and I didn't take off with the stolen car when she wanted to follow the creepy sister witches. Three times, brother. And I'm not even asking for a thank you. You called on the shadows and followed the witches. Maddox frowned, not with anger but worry. He knew I'd always feel guilty for what happened to Mason's mate and Brianna, and that I'd never again use them lightly. There was no other option. Those witches said someone was doing a tracking spell on me. They would have caught up to us eventually, then who knows where I'd be. I shuddered, remembering all too well what it felt like to be imprisoned by my father, to have my every breath and move watched. The shadows made us invisible so they couldn't see or hear me. One of the witches was on the phone, she said that the witch doing the tracking spell lost us. The other was pissed, started going off about how they're locked up and never get to see any action, and how this mysterious leader of theirs sent out other witches instead of them, sent out. Zeke repeated, what does that mean? It means there's witches in our pack, hiding, blending in for goddess knows how long. I looked up at Maddox, seeing the same hurricane of emotions in his eyes that raged within my own. They said that these witches blend in better, that they'll have everything set up for when she's ready to slip past our borders, and that once I realize she's here, it'll be too late for us all. Oh I knew they were planning something. I just didn't know it was this big, Clara swallowed, still nervous even though I alone kept Maddox rooted in place. They must have been planning this for some time. Explain. Just that single word charged the small space between us with Clara's fear and hesitation. Not once had I ever felt a shred of fear towards Maddox, but I knew the affect he had on those around him. Clara must have truly been desperate, because the found the strength to ask a question in return. How do I know you won't KL me as soon I tell you what I know? She asked, doing a remarkable job at hiding the tremble in her voice. You don't, 
but we don't make it a habit just kg people. I replied before Maddox could. I wasn't the most sensitive, but Maddox had the bedside manner of a rogue. So long as you're not trying to harm our people or anyone we care about, there's no reason to kill you. You said you wanted protection, we can arrange that if you help us in return. I, I don't have much information. It is enough for them to kill me over, though. She murmured, fearful even as she talked about them. It started a month or so ago, whispers in the witch community, talking about some big event going on. I remember wanting to go, but I was busy at the time. A performer friend of mine went, came back, different. Told me how things were finally changing for us witches, and that when the time came, all of us needed to be on board. A week later, she gave me an official invitation to one of their gatherings. There's no address to give you I never went. The whole thing felt, off to me. Kirsten was always one of those happy-go-lucky people, and after that meeting, she turned hateful, especially towards non-witches. She tried one last time, came to my house with another witch. They told me about the glory days for witches, when our power put us at the top of the food chain, even above werewolves. They told me how we could have that again, there was just one obstacle in our way, her eyes settled on me, and a chill worked its way down my spine, turning my nerve endings cold. A tribrid with the power to achieve that vision. They made you out to be this, monster, said that you sided with the werewolves and were even working to enslave vampires. When they mentioned taking over werewolf packs, I knew something was wrong. She continued, I threw the invitation away, and Kirsten, she stopped talking to me. Four days she just watched me, until she didn't show up for work. Turns out she quit, and I haven't seen her since. All I know is there's been new people coming to the club, which is strange since you can't come here without being invited by a regular. These new people would always come to watch me dance, only me. You think they were sent to watch you? Mason asked. Clara nodded, I think Kirsten vouched for me, and promised this woman I'd be on board, but I wasn't. My magic isn't the kind that fights in wars. You mentioned before you have to get up close to use your magic. I recalled, thinking back to when I had her pinned against the wall. That whisper soft touch at the back of my head, it had been her magic. I was now sure of it. If I remember correctly, you and I were pretty close back at the club. What exactly can you do? You felt that. She chuckled nervously, tucking a few ringlets behind her ear. My gift stems from spirit magic, it just works a bit differently. I can slip into someone's mind, sort of like what vampires do. It's not for very long, but there's a lot I can do while I'm in there. I've never used it to seriously hurt someone, but I have used it to stun some of the handsy customers. I, I am a novice at potions more likely to singe my eyebrows off than actually make anything successful. I've also tried some small spells that have worked, well, all except for the love spell. You were going to stun me like a witchy taser. I lifted an eyebrow. Well, you were about to rip my throat out. She replied, bringing her fingertips up to the exposed skin. I was two seconds away from saying fair enough when my brother's voice popped into my head. Since Dad was settling in just fine at Claire and Killian's, Sean was spending more time running patrol and training with Mason and the other warriors. I had asked him a handful of times how he was doing since losing his mate almost a year ago, but Sean always had a strange way of dealing with things. He was always able to keep his emotions in check which is why I instantly became worried when I heard how stunned he sounded. Hey, Alola, you and Maddox on your way back. Sean asked, his voice filling both mine and Maddox's heads. Yeah, we're on the plane now. 
why, did something happen? I asked warily, locking eyes with Maddox. Well, uh, yeah. Something did happen. I mean, I'm not sure how it happened like at all, but it did, Sean, what happened? You're not making any sense. I replied. Uh, that woman from the hospital the cursed one, yeah, she stopped by today looking for you too. Maddox's mom told her you'd both be back tonight, so she's here now. We'll be there in 45 minutes if she doesn't mind waiting. Maddox told Sean. I frowned, Sean, that's all you had to say? You sound a little freaked out. Sorry, I keep getting distracted, and uh, no that's not all I had to say. When the woman Flora, came here the first time she left before Killian or Dad got back, when they did get back, Dad started acting strange. I couldn't help it, I assumed the worst. My mind conjured up every bleak and dark scenario it could. Like freight trains veering towards the edge of a steep cliff, I was ready to plummet but then I slammed on the brakes, and felt my jaw go slack. She got here a couple minutes ago, and it just happened, he always assumed she must have died, but she didn't. Dad's mate was just cursed. Chapter 134 You sure they'll be all right together? Mason's a good guy, but even he can take so much. I said staring out the car window at the three of them. Brandon had a sly smirk on his face as he placed his hand on Clara's lower back, leading her into the lobby of the Crescent Inn. Mason walked on the other side of Clara and stepped forward to intervene when she turned and punched Brandon in the gut. She gave him a few choice words before standing next to Mason, as far away from Brandon as she could get. Brandon will bring him some joy. Zeke chuckled from where he sat in the back seat. Seriously though, he knows about Clara's witchy powers enough to stay out of her grasp. He'll be all right. I hope so. I sighed, I've been through enough for one night and the night's not even over yet. I had no idea what to expect walking into Claire and Killian's house. If Flora were still there would she be angry with Dad or reject him on the spot? Was there some part of her that even cared about finding a mate after everything she'd lost? And Dad, I didn't want T.O. think about how he felt, about what must have gone through his head when the bond snapped into place. Nothing could have prepared me for the tension that coated the walls and floor, which made every soft-spoken word echo as though it had been shouted across the room. I hesitated in the doorway before stepping inside, using the feel of Maddox's hand on my lower back as encouragement. The first thing I noticed was the petite blonde woman sitting on the sectional beside Claire, a cup of tea resting in her hands. Next was Sean, who sat on a bar stool by the kitchen island, his eyes wide as he watched Dad and Flora without a hint of shame. Dad sat on the end seat, angled towards the football game on the screen as he tried, and failed not to gawk at her. He took his chance to look when Maddox and I walked in. Flora's face was tinted a rosy shade of pink as she looked our way, confusion and just a hint of fear rounding out her almond-shaped eyes. She startled slightly when Grandma came gliding into the living room with plates stacked in her hands. It was impossible to feel anxious or unwelcome around Grandma. My point was proven when Flora's shoulders relaxed and her lips curved up ever so slightly. That whisper of a smile made the corners of her eyes crease, and I knew just by looking that a real smile from her would light up her face and transform it completely. Plates of scones lined up by flavor, macarons stacked in neat circles, and fruit tartlets covered the table. Nestled within the free spaces were small teacups of sugar cubes and cream. This would have been normal for Grandma if it hadn't been almost four in the morning, which was why Sean was the only one helping himself. How's your tea, dear? Would you like some more? Grandma smiled down at her, holding out the glass teapot in her hands. Actually, I would. It's very good. 
Flora's voice was soft and feminine, like the gentle breeze that provided a few seconds of relief from the early summer heat. Grandma topped off Flora's cup and was about to reply when Dad beat her to it. I ditched the disapproving expression I'd been throwing Sean these last few minutes and openly watched the scene unfold, hushing him when he snickered behind my back. It's lavender, that's what makes it sweet. She uh, she makes it herself. He stammered, his voice gritty and rough. It was the oddest thing. Dad was nervous, sitting there blinking at Flora like he couldn't believe he actually spoke. There was something D always find endearing about watching werewolves born and bred to become warriors, go speechless over the attention of a she-wolf, even if that werewolf was 45 years old and my dad. Oh, do you drink it too? She asked him, her grip on the teacup tightening as she brought it to her lips. The color across her high cheekbones deepened when dad's lips parted but no response came out. Of course he does. Never met a person who hasn't liked it. That, and my lavender cookies. You can put lavender in just about anything and make it taste better. Grandma smiled proudly, shaking her head at Dad when Flora looked downward to drop a few sugar cubes into her tea. Actually, come look on this top shelf for me. I think I might have a spare container or two. Oh, you don't have to do that. Flora said softly, tucking a wavy strand of hair behind her ear. Dad stood and looked down at her with a mixture of guilt, longing, and disbelief. I had seen each of those emotions on Dad's face at one point or another, but never at the same time. It changed his face, making it look younger while his eyes seemed to age. It's not a problem. He grumbled, heading through the kitchen and into the pantry. And you you can get taking these desserts to the basement. If any of them melt, you'll be helping me remake them. Got it. Grandma said, lifting an eyebrow at Sean who was working on his second plate of blueberry scones and chocolate macarons. Killian cleared the freezers out earlier so there's plenty of room. Claire and Grandma smiled at one another proudly. You gotta quit stress baking, Grandma. Sean shook his head, letting her shoo him from the living room. Once everyone found a reason to make themselves scarce, we were finally able to talk to Flora. Her eyes drifted up from the surface of her milky tea, past the curls of steam that filled the air. Even with everything going on, they were strong. You're the new Alpha and Luna, she said as we approached her eyes on Maddox as we took a seat on the couch just a few feet away. Before I was attacked, your father was Alpha. You look just like him. We are. Maddox nodded, his sharp features softening. Thank you for coming out here on such short notice, especially given your situation. You've been out for a long time. Has anyone filled you in on the present? The doctor that passed along your message filled me in on a few things, you being one of them, Luna. She took a steadying breath and sipped at her tea before continuing. The psychologist told me to take it slow, but I can't stand not knowing. I'm sure you have questions, and I'll try to answer them if you tell me how I woke up. Last week, a witch broke into our home. She would have KD me if another witch hadn't been there to stop her. I explained, the one that broke in had a mark on her hand, like the one that used to be on yours. It started fading the moment I woke up, but I'll never forget what it looked like. It's all I'd see in my dreams. The witch that saved your life, is she a friend? Flora asked tentatively. I'm beginning to think so. I nodded. And did she, did she KL the witch? Her voice dropped to a whisper, but I didn't think she noticed. She did. I replied and watched as Flora let out a great sigh of relief. The teacup in her hand rattled as she set it on the table. I swore I saw some of the weight leave her eyes, evaporating as relief took its place. 
I was cursed because of a mistake my parents made, one they both paid for with their lives. She began, and the soft tone her voice had taken on made me wonder if this were her first time saying it out loud. They were Alpha and Luna of a small pack up north, and desperately wanted a baby. You know how rare it is for werewolves to struggle with having children, especially Alphas. They were both too desperate to see that talking to a witch was where everything went wrong. Not all witches are bad, there's a few here that are on our side. They're trying to keep the pack safe. I promised. The world has changed since my father was Alpha, but the safety of our people always remains priority. Maddox added, warmth filling the golden flecks in his eyes as they met my own. I believe you, that not all witches are bad, but this one was. She acted like she wasn't, pretended she was going to help them if they repay the favor someday. All she needed was some of their blood, she shuddered, and her features grew solemn. Decades-old pain was still fresh in her mind, because to her it hadn't been so long ago. They gave it to her and within a month they were going to be parents. That favor the witch mentioned, she came asking for it when my mother was six months pregnant, but what she wanted, my parents couldn't give her. What did she want? Maddox asked. A baby, one as healthy and strong as I was. Her only catch was that my father had to be the one to impregnate her. She never told them why, but they both refused anyway. They were offended she hadn't cared that they were mated, and that she wouldn't choose from any number of unmated males in the pack. The witch vanished for a while, and they thought that was the end of it until the night my mother's water broke, the jagged breath she took made my throat clench but I forced myself to remain stoic as I listened to her story, when all I wanted to do was cry for her. The witch was there that night. While my mother gave birth surrounded by her midwives, she was down the hall, with my father. He fulfilled his end of the deal, but why? I glanced at Maddox. Both of us were absorbed within Flora's past, even though neither of us had any clue how it connected to the present. Believe me, it wasn't willingly, what they didn't know was that the witch that helped them practiced a dark kind of magic, powered by blood. Giving her my father's blood it was what she needed to get into his bed. Her voice cracked and I watched as she visibly pulled herself together, swallowing back the tears until fury shined through. While she was giving birth, she could feel him mating with the witch and then felt the mate bond snap when she stabbed him in his heart. My mother stumbled inside seconds after he took his last breath, all she asked was why. And did she tell her? I cleared my throat, knowing if I hadn't my voice would have come out as a croak. I knew little to nothing about blood magic, other than it ran in Holly's family down her mother's side. The thought of it affecting a completed mate bond, shoving it down long enough to take advantage of someone like that, it chilled me deeper than anything that happened so far. She told her the child she was having with her mate it would be the strongest blood witch to walk the earth. Join our Facebook and WhatsApp group for more updates, link is given in description, rest audio book will be continued in next episode.